everyone. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm Henrietta Davis, and I am your neighborhood person. Uh, I live here on Chestnut Street. My husband Richard here, also on Chestnut Street. We're, uh, I am the community representative to the I-90 process. I assume all of you are here because you're interested in finding out how uh, the Mass Turnpike interchange and viaduct are going to be redesigned and what's going to be happening with that process. We're, um, we're here tonight to give input as a part of that process, and Bill is going to describe to you a little bit more about how the process goes. I was named as a community representative uh, last fall, um, and since that time, um, I've been working with others to find out what concerns people in the neighborhood have, to give you an opportunity to understand what the, what the uh, features of this proposal uh, are, what the options might be for the way it's built, and to find out what concerns you might have. Uh, so that we're going to go further in that process this evening. Uh, we had a, a meeting able to bring in a number of people to give some background on some of these issues. And tonight we're going to hear from the uh, Department of Transportation uh, about uh, in depth about some of the options that they're going to be putting forward. So I'm going to uh, be listening tonight and be interested in hearing what your concerns are. And I'm going to hand it over to Bill Degnan, who's been involved in the process for quite a bit longer than I have. Bill. Bill Great. from the city. Thanks, Henrietta. Yes, I'm Bill Degnan with the, um, <coughs> sorry, we got a cold, um, with the city's community development department. And as Henrietta said, I've been involved in this process for two and a half years or so now. Um, <coughs> The Mass Department of Transportation put together an Alston Stakeholder Task Force, um, of which uh, Cambridge, I'm the sole representative from Cambridge. There's a very large task force that represents Alston and the different interests in Alston. Um, so I've participated in most of those meetings over the last two and a half years. I think this is our fourth meeting or so here in Cambridge. Um, but that has been a long process of coming up with the alternatives that you're going to see here tonight. And what we're talking about is these three alternatives and helping frame what's called the draft environmental impact report, which MassDOT is uh, looking to put out uh, this coming fall. So that's going to be the next step in the environmental permitting for this process, but not the last step. So there will be additional opportunities to comment on that DEIR, as it's called. <coughs> and then additional environmental um, permitting processes uh, after that, too. So um, as Henrietta said, we really want to hear what people in Cambridge have to say about the alternatives. So she and I can then go back to the committee and uh, mass dot and represent um, what people here are saying. <coughs> in addition to participating in the stakeholder task force, MassDOT has uh, very generously come over to the city several times and had staff-to-staff uh, -staff meetings to talk about traffic, um, about how this project will work, about noise. Uh, we're very interested in connectivity, uh, not only across the river, uh, but around the Charles River Basin and making sure that that connectivity is improved and works for people in Cambridge. Uh, we've talked about open space, uh, so there's been a lot of communication over the last few years, and we're you know, looking to keep that going as we move ahead. Thank you, and I'm Jack Wofford. Um, a, uh, had a lot of experience in transportation in the past, but presently I live up the street on Cottage Street in Cambridge Court, and I facilitated the meeting on March 30th, so two weeks ago. I, I'm just wondering how many people were at the meeting of March 30th? All right, so you've seen me before. And some of you are new, so we're going to try to follow the agenda that you have in front of you um, in a way that gives you the basics. But this is the Department of Transportation opportunity to present. <laughs> And we're going to follow the segments on this agenda that you have. Uh, the, uh, I will introduce in a minute the folks on behalf of DOT. And they have a slideshow of fewer than 30 slides. They're going to break it into the segments that are noted on this agenda. 
So we will have a segment on the introduction to the project and the process and the three main turnpike options in what's called the throat. And they will describe that to you. It's the part right across from Magazine Beach. And we'll then break for a few minutes of clarifying questions. But we'll keep those just clarifying, not your views, not opinions. There's time for that at the end of the session. Then the next segment will be on traffic and access to and from Cambridge. And we'll have some slides. And then we'll have some clarifying questions on that. And then we'll have noise, which was a big issue um, both two weeks ago and at the January meeting where DOT presented. And then we're going to have 45 minutes of open discussion and opportunity to express your views and such. So if you could kind of separate in your mind what's a clarifying question <laughs> and, you know, what is my view, I think it will help everybody because it gives everybody a chance uh, for the full discussion at the end. So let me now introduce. Can I interrupt yes, for a moment? I, I forgot to do what um, anybody in my position should have known to do, which is to recognize two city councilors who are here. Uh, Mark McGovern, I think I saw Dennis Carlone in the back. I don't know if anybody else is here. Any other city councilors? Welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, and I also want to recognize Suzanne Rasmussen, who's here as the head of uh, uh, transportation and environment for the city community development department. So we are also, thank you. And let me now introduce the uh, team from, on behalf of DOT. Chris Kalman, project manager of the consultant team. Hannah Brockhaus and Nate Cabral were both with Howard Stein, oh, Howard Hudson. Stein Hudson and um, doing community outreach and processing meetings and helping with meetings of this kind. So Chris, over to you and um, tell us about the project. Terrific. Thank you, Jack. I also want to acknowledge we have Donnie Daly in the back from MassDOT uh, is with us tonight as well. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, pleased to be here tonight to kind of give you this overview and, and uh, kind of give you hopefully a better understanding of how this project is moving forward and some of the details that we're looking at uh, for this project. Uh, this slide's been up for a little bit as far as the shared priorities. Um, this has kind of been a slide that was you know, developed some time ago with the, with the task force, with the community, uh, just to kind of get a sense of where uh, everybody's priorities are relative to the project. Next, just to touch on uh, kind of the project purpose. Uh, certainly, I think uh, there's, there's been a lot of discussion uh, that this, uh, this is a major project and lots are happening. But really what fundamentally started this project was the need to replace this aging and obsolete viaduct. Uh, so we need to be doing that. Uh, it allows us the opportunity to kind of straighten uh, the turnpike and, and, and realign some things, take advantage of the all electronic tolling that's been uh, in place now, and really rebuild this interchange to more of an urban style interchange. You don't have these big sweeping ramps it's more of a street grid um, uh, type of scenario. You can realign Soldiers Field Road, uh, create a more vibrant Cambridge Street, uh, and look to construct other elements, you know, besides the highway and those type of elements, like a shared use path, or you know, rebuilding the Lincoln Street um, footbridge over the pike. We're gonna be doing that as well. Um, and then also introducing you know, some separated bicycle facilities in the streets that we're creating. And then finally, looking to incorporate and construct um, Beacon Park Yard layover and the West Station facility. So this graphic here, uh, let's see how difficult it is, but it's, it's a graphic that's getting a lot of mileage. It's really an overview of kind of a big picture of what's going on with the project. Lots, lots of information going on here. And a few of the kind of the highlights is you can kind of see here, this is the turnpike. Um, it's getting realigned. We moved it a little bit further south. Uh, that's heading towards the rail yard. So what's happening here is, is this area got a little bit condensed. We were looking at more train capacity here. Now it's more around uh, eight consists or so for that facility. Uh, some of the other big changes is we're looking to incorporate uh, three streets to the north uh, up until six 
six to nine months ago, we kind of had a, a two street network to the north, uh, which kind of married up into what Harvard was considering for their development. And now it's a three street type of network. Um, what else? We've got certainly kind of this is a big element that's got added to the project, and that is more of a dramatic shift in Soldiers Field Road to create a considerable open space in this area here. Um, and part of that really is going to be creating this underpass. So if you're on Soldiers Field Road, you would actually go kind of under this portion here and then kind of come back up. Similar to what happens at River Street where you kind of go under River Street, that's what's happening. Oops. Let me go back here. That's what's happening in this location. Also part of that location is the opportunity to create kind of this at-grade pedestrian connection uh, from this whole district. You can kind of connect off the shared use path system and walk and bike right over to the, uh, the new open space on the river. Uh, part of this reconfiguration here uh, incorporates a new off-ramp kind of outbound off ramp that will come in and you can kind of go over uh, Soldier's Fear Road at that location. And then part of that will be to create additional open space here and we're looking to study closing the River Street off ramp. And I'll have more details on that as we go through the slides tonight. So, you know, kind of folks talked about the draft EIR. Well, you know, what is it? It's really our next major submittal. Um, it will cover what we're talking about is this concept 3K refined. That's, that's that graphic I just showed you. And we're gonna be explaining and detailing and kind of analyzing the, the, uh, the options in that, uh, and the throat options, which I'll get into in a minute. And when we go through this, we look to analyze for all these elements that you, know, you see up here, the traffic and the noise and the air quality and so forth. So all that stuff gets detailed in the draft EIR. I think, Jack, you were asking earlier about what is the draft EIR. Uh, that's a filing that we will have to MEPA. Um, it's a public document. Everybody will get to comment on it. Uh, there is a, uh, a scoping session or a briefing that's held where people can attend and ask questions. Uh, it's, a, it's a robust process that you can write in comments and so forth. And then what happens is uh, the MEPA will issue a, uh, basically a scope uh, to finalize that draft EIR. And then the next submission we'll call it, we call it a, a final environmental impact report. So there's a, certainly some time to kind of weigh in and uh, comment on these, on these documents. Chris, why don't you just note that between the draft and the final, is when the officials in the Department of Transportation make a decision of what their preferred option is. But at this stage, and in the draft impact report, there will be no preference given to one option over another. It's supposed to be a balanced, objective presentation of all the options, but the decision making takes place once the draft is done, the comments are in, and then uh, the final will reflect those decisions. Yeah, very good point, Jack. And that's kind of that's exactly what we're, we're presenting this document, and um, the team and the mass DOT is not actually choosing which alternative in the throat. Uh, outside of the throat, there is a preferred uh, concept, but within the throat, uh, we're leaving that open to three that we're going to talk about tonight. So the illustrations, I think these are some of the things that was asked by the community in the past, um, and we will have this information in the draft EIR. Certainly some illustrations that you've got a better visual as far as what the, um, what the differences look like uh, in the throat. Uh, the noise analysis for Cambridge, we'll kind of look into that a little bit tonight, give you kind of some ideas what we're looking at there. Uh, talk about construction how we see the project getting phased and the durations, uh, including kind of what happens with the noise and the traffic during construction. Those are elements that get um, incorporated and, and uh, discussed in the document. And the River Street ramp, uh, to show how when we look to reconfigure that uh, for more open space, we'll have some plans to kind of show how that space could look uh, when, we, when we look to uh, 
reconfigure that. So the uh, getting into the throat alternatives and kind of how they look, uh, let's see how, I guess you can see a little bit, but so this illustration is the highway viaduct alternative. Um, and similar to today where you have the viaduct on top and you have the rail facilities below it, it does have provisions for the two tracks uh, that go over to Grand Junction. These are the two mainline tracks that go in and out of Boston. Still have the same number of uh, lanes for all the vehicles, whether it's I-90 or Soldier Field Road. And then we have um, on this side here, next to the river, you know, we have the Port Dudley White Path. Uh, in this alternative, we are looking to see if we can increase that width to, say, 12 feet. Uh, along with that, there's provisions to have some increased open space between uh, the pathway and Soldiers Field Road. Uh, so we're looking to do that as well. Next slide here gives you uh, just kind of a little bit better visual of how this could work. This slide is actually taken from the City of Boston's placemaking study uh, where they uh, look to uh, provide some input to the team on uh, a whole host of issues. But these, uh, this slide's taken from that study and you can see kind of the viaduct, highway viaduct on top and, and the rail below it in Soldiers Field Road. So the next uh, uh, section for the throat area was uh, an all at grade version and this was advanced uh, by a better city and uh, I do want to point out that like this graphic here while it's not exactly uh, the latest as far as what the lane and shoulder widths it gives you an idea of kind of how this is is shaping up you have all four of the tracks uh, kind of condensed on this side and then you have you know, the, the uh, interstate and located here, Soldiers Field Road, and then the new, uh, or the, the bike path uh, next to the river. This alternative does um, kick out the uh, bike path uh, over the river, kind of either cantilevered or pile supported. You know, it's really a, a, it's a tight area in here. And, you know, ABC's been working with BU. BU's on, on this side here to see if they can kind of squeeze in and maybe shift everything over a few feet. I think the latest we're hearing is around seven feet or so to try to take advantage of all that space and minimize uh, any impacts to the river with this alternative. And then this, uh, again, little illustration uh, to kind of give you a sense of uh, what this looks like with having uh, pretty much everything at grade. You have the trains, the highway, Soldiers Field Road, and then the bike path over here. And then the, uh, the final uh, throat variation that we're looking at is uh, basically kind of reversing and having the rail above and the highway below it. And this was advanced by Ari Sebet. And uh, some interesting aspects here is, you know, you have, still have the two uh, Grand Junction lines up above. And I want to do want to say that all three of these variations uh, provide that provision to have two tracks go over the Grand Junction line uh, in, into Cambridge. Uh, but this alternative also, kind of right up here, there is a uh, like a shared use path next to the trains. It is elevated, it's up on the viaduct, and that would help connect uh, Cambridge Street. Uh, connecting over towards Grand Junction. So it has that added element for some uh, bike and pedestrian facilities. And again, near the river, um, it's still a little tight here. Um, and I do, I should, should back up a little bit. With the highway viaduct, we're actually able to relocate and shift Soldiers Field Road a little bit closer to the viaduct. And that's what's allowed us to create a little strip of open space there where these, the last couple, are a little bit more tighter and we don't have that, uh, don't have that ability as much. And then this is the, uh, the illustration that shows uh, that option with the viaduct over I-90. Again, you got the trains here, the, the two Grand Junction trains, I-90 and Soldiers Field Road here. And I think that's it, Jack, for this throat, uh, yes. 
So, okay. Jack, maybe before you launch into clarifying questions, yeah. um, just the image that Chris showed you with all the call out bubbles on it, and where he walked you through some of the salient features, we printed 60 of those and brought them here tonight. They were on the sign in table. So, if anybody wants one, doesn't have one, I'm happy to go get it for you, stick your hand up. But, you know, as you ask your questions, Yep, one over there, one over there, okay. As you ask your questions, you know, maybe it'll be helpful to have one of those to look at. All right, that's a presentation really of the purposes of the project, an overview of the project, and these three options for what's called the throat, which is the very narrow section of the Pike and Soldiers Field Road uh, between BU and the river right across from uh, magazine Beach. Kathy, you look as yeah. though you're going to yeah, say I'm just, I'm, I'm so happy to have the models, but isn't this wrong? I thought, isn't uh, the I-90, oh, I see it. So some of I-90 will be under the trains, and some That's of I-90 exactly won't right. be under the yeah. train. If you go back to this one, you'd see basically the I-90, um, you know, yeah. westbound barrel is underneath the, the rail viaduct. The other thing I was confused by is in the uh, the 3K, the first version, you said that the parkland would be 12 feet wide, but it looks like it's like 24 feet wide in the drawing, right? It, can we go back to that? Um, Get it? Yeah, the section. The section view? Yeah. Yeah, there. Or, or the next, or the next one. So as I was mentioned in the highway viaduct, this alternative Soldiers Field Road is shifted further, closer into the viaduct, uh -huh. and that creates some space here to to add to the open space. So is it 12 feet minimum, or is it 12 to 24 feet oh, maximum? So what, what the 12 was, was, was the bike path. Okay, so how many feet is it? And then this year, uh, I think it's around eight feet or so. In the, in the tightest area, and then it kind of flares over. So, <laughs> other questions? Yes. In the construction of a rail viaduct versus highway viaduct, is that a more expensive, more problematic, more difficult construction? And I'm also thinking about bad weather. Is having a rail viaduct, because I assume that means grade from somewhere, does that make it a little bit more of a problem? Um, so I will say that part of our process going forward is to uh, take a closer look at the kind of the constructability, and, and we have. I mean, there was an initial feasibility study done that looks to uh, take advantage and see how these were constructed. Um, the rail grades are a challenge. They have to, they're more gradual, certainly, to you know, climb a train. Um, but the layout that we have will accommodate that. Um, and, you know, as far as you know, how it operates and so forth. It's it's a workable, you know, we could get the trains to climb. It's it's kind of maxing things out, I will say. Um, but, you know, that's that's kind of what we're gonna be depicting in the draft DIR. And, and the second part, is it much more expensive? Uh, Cost-wise, uh, we're still looking at the cost of all three variations. So, uh, I don't want to get into the details of the cost. That will be presented uh, as we kind of, you know, do some more calculations and figure things out. And those of you who were at the meeting two weeks ago know that the proponents of the two so-called at-grade options presented what they believe are the comparative costs and there was a significant difference. But that's all to be worked out in more detail. The gentleman right back here. Uh, when, you were, when you had the map in the beginning, Yep. You referred to the area that seemed to be in the vicinity of the West Station, thing, and you said there are three somethings in that area. Three columns or three uh, This area here is kind of probably what I was thinking about three roadways. So previously we kind of had uh, two connecting roadways heading north towards uh, Harvard's development and uh, recent uh, coordination with them is they they have plans for this type of three street network. So our interchange plans are kind of matching up with what they're looking at. And just in brief to add to that response, when the project really was first unveiled, 
there was a serious look at what you might call suburban type ramps and things to and from the turnpike. And there was a major shift made for access to and from the turnpike by a series of urban streets. So that you don't see the usual suburban type highway ramps and that was uh, as a result of discussion in the task force. Is that? That's that correct. correct, yeah. And that's, you know, the, those suburban style ramps, those are the big loop ramps and so forth, higher speed. That's uh, what we have what's out the there now. now. Yeah, that's yeah. what's out there now. So all that's, you know, going to get reconfigured to a more urban street grid. Yes, ma'am. So my question is, that sounds like a fait accompli. And why aren't there three options for that? Why is it now? And I figure you're going to discuss this. You better discuss this in the next section. But why are we all being sent over there to go back over here? I guess my question is, why don't we get three options for that also? For the street patterns. To, yeah, to go from, from Star Drive over to Cambridge. Well, we're going to get to the whole okay. segment on Star out to Cambridge. So, okay. we'll, so yeah. just hold that options? good question. Suzanne. Can you speak to the relative volumes? How many cars a day on Storrow versus uh, the Turnpike versus how many trains per day? Uh, you know, that's a great question. I don't have the volumes committed to memory. I do have some slides when we get into the turns for River Street to kind of show you some volumes of, uh, of that particular uh, aspect. But, you know, I think the Turnpike carries like 150,000 vehicles a day. Uh, don't remember offhand how much Soldiers Field Road is, but it's substantial. But Absolutely less, subst way less. Oh yeah, way less. And trains, way less. Trains are less too. Yeah. Right. I, I disagree with that. If you look at the numbers at rush hour, trains are carrying about forty percent of the traffic in this corridor. So no, really no, I, I don't mean that. I just, I, I guess. No, but when we say way less, then we sort of say, well, transit doesn't really do anything. We need to remember that transit A is the only, only mode with capacity to grow. And we need to remember that. So let's not shortchange transit because we think that no one uses it. Okay. So I, I think you're reading something into my question, which is not what I intend at all. Okay. I've, I'm heading down the noise path. We're going to get to the noise. And I, I just wanted to understand that in terms of noise generation, there's a very big difference. Vehicles are the predominant producer of noise compared to trains because there are many fewer trains. So. I, other than that, I agree with everything you just said, Ari. Thanks. Other questions, Renata? And then. <coughs> Could you, in your work, also look at what the, the transit, if it's fully occupied, the maximum amount, because both the turnpike and Soldiers Field Road are, are in many moments already at maximum. What would the maximum capacity be of those four um, trail trains? Yeah, so part of the uh, effort with the project that uh, MassDOT is undertaking is working with the CTPS staff to help us have a better appreciation, understanding of the transit capacity and what's happening and project that out to a, a 2040 build. That's kind of what the draft EIR has, is, is looking ahead that far to see how much transit is there. So uh, that is part of the kind of the, the calculations that are done to figure out growth in the traffic and the transit and so forth. So that's part of it. Next question, yes. Thank you, Jack. I have a question about process. I'm heading toward a wrap up of the DEIR process in the early fall, you said. And I wondered about, is the, and we've seen three alternates for the third area. Is there any possibility of other options being looked at at this point? Or is, the, is, 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 it, is it basically a locked in? <laughs> Set of choices. Um, so I could say that we've probably been looking at this for three plus years now and uh, you know we started <laughs> off with the, the one series alternatives and the two series now we're into three you know A, B, C all the way up to K so there's been a tremendous amount of uh, options considered we've publicly presented the options we're gathering all that feedback and kind of this is where we're at right now if certainly there are other ideas that folks have, you could send them in as part of that public process with the draft EIR. Um, but you know, MassDOT is looking to say, hey, we need to move this project forward. We've got a lot of good public input. Let's get it out there and get some reaction. Yes, ma'am. Um, when you talk about public input, 
you're just talking about public input from Alston, because Cambridge, until recently, never had any opportunity to talk at any of those meetings, because I went to quite a few of them. And as a Cambridge resident, I was not allowed to talk. So there's no input from Cambridge until the last few months. So we had... close to 30 task force meetings, but we've also had about six public meetings that uh, anybody can get up and speak. It's not just for all the residents or anything like that. It is a full public process. So. And if it helps, Chris, you know, one of the things that we have done is um, the, uh, the meeting that we had um, with this group on the 17th of January uh, this year was designed to mirror the public information meeting that we had in Alston the prior month. And in December of 2015, we were in this auditorium um, one week after we'd had the public information meeting for Alston. Um, typically, the city of Cambridge has been good enough to help push um, any meet public meeting notifications um, for public meetings in Alston. We also advertise all of those meetings in the Cambridge Chronicle. So there's been no effort to shut Cambridge up. Can I just say that when you were at the meeting, they did not allow you to talk. Only people from Austin were allowed to talk. No, ma'am, you're, you're, you're thinking of one of the I-90 Austin task force meetings. Task force meetings, the way those are set up is we, because it is a task force meeting, they are all open to the public. You're welcome to uh, attend and be there. And if there is time to comment, because it's a task force meeting, we give priority to task force business. I don't know when you went, um, but you know Bill has been with us uh, on the task force representing Cambridge since ably, since 2014. Um, you now have uh, Henrietta involved. Um, we, we typically have had a, a Cambridge city representative. I think Suzanne has been there a few times. Um, so if an Alston resident showed up to a task force meeting and you know was trying to offer commentary, if we were running out of time, uh, you know they may have been told we have a public meeting process that parallels this. You're welcome to you know email or call, but you know that's that's been the way the task force has worked since 2014. So again, no effort has been made to shut you out. She clearly feels shut out, so we'll just acknowledge that. The, there, the task force has I think 50 members. Is that right? About? They're about something like that. So, and they they speak a lot. <laughs> so. Other questions, clarifying questions on this, and then we'll move. Glenn. Yes, uh, Glenn Berkowitz, uh, Wake a Better City, uh, uh, the advocates of, uh, of one of the three options in the throat. I just want to help clarify, um, Jack. Several people asked questions just now about what the width is of the increased parkland. And I just wanted to clarify in 60 seconds or less that the parkland in the Paul Dudley White in this project start obviously at River Street and they go all the way down over to the BU Bridge where there's that boardwalk that they've shown the, the BU Bridge. And it's important, I think, to look at it as three different sections. The answers to the questions that were given to you, uh, we're talking just about the center section. And they said, uh, yes, the viaduct allows a little bit more width for the park than the act leads to. But what they didn't tell you is that for the whole eastern section, the two at grade options provide the opposite. They provide more width for parkland than the viaduct does. And then also on the western section, as you approach River Street, where you see all the green and this drawing, all three options provide, provide about the same amounts of green. So I just didn't want you to get the misimpression that the viaduct gives you a wider park in terms of the totality of the park and the public life than the entrance. Thank you for that opportunity. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was at the meeting um, about three weeks ago, and this is the first time I've been coming to the meetings, even though I've always I've been very interested in sort of listening uh, for information, but not showing up at the meetings. So. Last time, someone spoke about possibly covering over the, the at-grade um, uh, roads. Uh, I think they were talking about at, during the, in that narrow area and creating something of a high line or some, a covered section. And that's 
that's not being considered? That's off the table? So I apologize. I wasn't here for the last meeting where that kind of was discussed. I don't know if you're... Are you, are you talking about kind of decking over for air rights? Oh, sorry. sorry. Oh, oh, so where part of the roadway is covered. Also on the 30th, if I recall oh, correctly, the, the they, they, were, um, they were showing, I believe that Tom now, and yeah. Glenn, you should feel free to weigh in, but I believe that what uh, Tom presented was the idea that there would be, if I remember, he showed a slide. If, were you remembering this too, ma'am? It shows the throat, it widens out at either end, and there was kind of a blue box placed over either end. I think there was something discussed about that as well. And, and I think Tom mentioned that as well during our, our meeting with Brooke. All right. What I would point out here is that if you, if you see, uh, you can see where the viaduct is, there's a sort of a pathway on that side. There's some room on the other side that can have a pathway. Theoretically, you'd have to look at some uh, cross-dimensional. You could theoretically put, uh, extend that across the other half of the turnpike. It would be more costly to do that, but that would allow you to have some kind of uh, park, green space. Um, it would allow also to manage and to get some of the drainage issues. You basically put the, uh, gather the water on top and be able to drain it more easily. Um, and it would uh, allow some noise mitigation as well. Um, obviously, there are a lot of engineering things to look at. There was also a comment at that meeting from somebody in the audience who said, what about a highline approach which puts the pathway system and the park system up on an elevated structure and the others down below. That may be what you're remembering as well. So we'll come back to that in the comment section. It's now 7.20, so let's move to traffic and access with some more slides. Okay, great. Thank The microphone was working that great anyway, but so I'll speak loudly. So the next slide really we want to kind of give you a sense of how the traffic, you know, how do you get from Cambridge to the Turnpike, etc. And so this first slide, if you're coming kind of outbound from Soldiers Field Road, you have this uh, kind of this new connection point here. This is where that there's a new ramp, and you would come down here. You could come down here and make this right. The old Soldiers Field Road is, is here, where you have that right turn. So that's kind of in, in a big picture view of, of, of the changes there. Uh, next, I kind of wanted just to kind of show you how you get the different moves. So if you're if you're you know trying to get from uh, Cambridge uh, and head westbound on the Turnpike, you can kind of see see these arrows here. You would come over Western Avenue, come down. You could make a right onto what we refer to as the North Connector, or you could make a right on the Cambridge Street, come down this road here, and jump on the Turnpike and head west. Or you could continue Cambridge Street and take this connector to head west. And how would you go inbound yeah. on the pike? I'll get there. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so the next one here uh, which shows you, again, if you're coming from Cambridge and you want to go eastbound, Again, come over the river, you have the ability to take a right on North Connector or Cambridge, and then you come down what's referred to as Cattle Drive, all the way down to the, to the interchange, you make a left, and you head um, onto the turnpike inbound. If you're uh, on the turnpike, in this case, uh, heading westbound, and you want to go back, kind of like a backtrack, if you're on the turnpike, you would take the off-ramp, come right up, come right up and head across the river. Um, you know, there is a second exit point uh, westbound. I wouldn't think people would kind of come up here to go all the way back, but you could also have a second exit point uh, off the highway. And then if you're heading eastbound and you want to go to Cambridge, you would come in on the turnpike. There's an off-ramp here. You come up to the first signal. You could make a left head north to Cambridge Street or you could continue straight across, make a left at the next signal, and head up north and get across to, uh, to Cambridge in that, in that fashion. Crossing over? They both cross over, that's, true. that's correct. So there's the bridges right here and right here, so they cross over the turnpike. Uh, as far as kind of the additional open space, uh, you know, here's just some kind of rough 
values that we're looking at. Still trying to go through the analysis, but you know this area here, uh, kind of we're looking at from the throat all the way through. It ranges from like say three and a half acres to four and a half acres, and it does depend on which alternative uh, in the throat is chosen. Uh, as I mentioned, the highway viaduct alternative uh, looks to have the most open space, and the all that grade version has the least amount of open space. So actually, so actually, if the next slide here, we want to get into kind of what happens with the trade-offs with closing that River Street uh, ramp and kind of repurposing what's happening there. Uh, can you wait till we're done, sir? Okay. Uh, so a lot of comment, a lot of feedback about how you know that narrow section of the Paul Dudley White Path right next to the river. Uh, there's not enough room for the cyclists and the pedestrians. So what you know this really allows a, a nice fix there to accommodate a much wider path uh, in that location, providing more safety for the cyclists uh, who use that. It's, we know it's a very well-traveled connection. Um, and it, by closing this ramp and having the ramp further back, it also uh, moves a significant amount of traffic out of that intersection. You know, I think everybody knows today how bad that intersection is. It's horrific uh, for, for all modes, really. So you know, being able to pull some of that traffic out of there is going to help with the efficiency of that, of that operation. I guess uh, there's been some comments about how much volume uh, you know, roughly speaking, most of the volume is not taking a right turn. So the folks that come off of that ramp head northbound and they're on that off ramp, 75 to 80 percent of them are not <coughs> going to take the right turn to go to Cambridge. That's the volumes, that's the counts that we see today. Uh, the folks that do take the right turn, uh, that's where you see around 1,700 vehicles or so are making that right turn on a daily basis. Uh, during the peak hours, around 80 to 90 in the morning, and then you have 150 so in the p.m. peak. So that kind of gives you an idea of, of the volume that we're looking at at, at that turn uh, at that turn ramp. Uh, let me back up. So there we go. Uh, we also have you've got to travel through more signals. Uh, we realize that. Uh, to take that diversion. Uh, the diversion itself is about, it's, I think we calculated it's, it's less than 900 feet longer to take this route uh, to go through the interchange and kind of come back uh, versus if you were to stay there today. Another interesting point is when we kind of try to do some calculations of how long it takes to kind of make these maneuvers, when we look to project the volumes, um, uh, we look at a 2040 uh, case and if in 2040 the project did nothing and we didn't do this project they would be continually having more delay in that off ramp you go through cycles and you know you can't get up to the ramp everybody's trying to go left uh, so you, you're in the neighborhood of like five to six minutes of, of additional delay there versus if you actually built the project uh, granted you're kind of taking that loop to go around but we're in uh, you know two to three minutes of additional delay there. So you know if if we do nothing, it will get worse there, and it won't address the, the kind of the pedestrian issue that we have uh, trying to fix that location there as well. Some folks have asked, well, can we just have can we have a right turn and not have the other turns? Uh, the challenge there is is the width. You know, there's about 23 feet or so, um, and you know when you have a single lane off ramp. You need to have some provisions for emergencies to get by, passing stall vehicles and so forth, and that's in the 19 feet range. So it doesn't leave you a whole lot of opportunity to kind of widen that um, and also provide you know, nice pedestrian and bicycle accommodation. So it doesn't provide that same benefit if you didn't have, um, if, you, if, you, if you took that uh, ramp out, that turnout. And finally, you know, none of this stuff is, you know, we're looking to present this in the draft EIR, uh, and as we say here, it's, it's not set in stone. And we're back to noise. Okay. Questions on the traffic patterns? Yes. So, okay, so you say it's going to take, this guy says it's going to take maybe three minutes. 
or more, a little roughly, to go off Storrow Drive and then through that neighborhood and then end up making a right across the river. So I'm not buying that, and I actually think that's why you have a second pattern right there, because when it gets backed up, you're going to need a second route. But that's not even my clarifying question. My clarifying question is, I live in Cambridge Court. Are you seriously telling me that I'm going to have to get to get back on the Mass Pike? I'm going to have to drive down Putnam Ave at rush hour, past River Street, and turn left on Western Ave. Like, I'm going to have to. I have to do that now. Yeah. But I, have, I have to do that now, and it's pretty. It's so this is this is how you would access the turnpike, basically today. You have to come over Western Avenue to get to the turnpikes. We're, we're not we're not changing. Right, uh, I do have access. to do that now. But I, I guess I just feel like you're cutting Cambridge off. You're telling us we have to go over here and here and here and then come back around there. Why aren't there three options? Just like there's three options for the throat. Why haven't you given us three options for this? Mm -hmm. You just dismissed one by saying, well, there wouldn't be enough room for the bicyclists. You can't turn right, you can't turn right on this. So, okay, so my let me, question let me is, move on. why haven't you given us three options? Point. We'll come back no. during the discussion to Well, my question, clarifying that. question is, why aren't there three options? There's three options for the throat. Why aren't there three options for this? We've been through. There's probably 30 options of the interchange itself. So what we're focusing in on is the 3K alternative with three variations in the program. If you welcome the comment on other options or variations in the rest of the interchange, this is where the public process and the DOT has guided us to what we're presenting tonight. And it is true that all three of the options have eliminated the right turn exit ramp. To Cambridge. But the clarifying so. question, the very first question, they yeah. didn't say it would take you three minutes to do all those turns. They said it would be three additional minutes to what you would normally expect in 2017, but that in 2040 it would be six additional delay minutes versus the three additional delay minutes. They don't think it's going to take you three minutes to get through all that. They think it will be three minutes slower than it currently is. But in 2040 it would be six minutes slower than it currently is. Is that correct? Well, so it's, it's probably a little hard to explain. So in 2040, if we right. did nothing, then it would be six minutes slower than now. You would, Certainly you would be right. a lot of delay there because right. of the cycle <laughs> versus if you did the project, yeah, that's what it's actually, saying. you know, say two to three minutes versus that five to six. Minutes. Right, right. But they don't think it's going to take three minutes. They think it's going to take three additional minutes. So it's a little bit more delay. So like that's a noise. Yeah, that's what it is. Yes, and at one point you talked about the problem with the right turn over the River Street Bridge and the congestion there, and you said it would go away. So I assume that it gets moved someplace else, and I think it's it's distributed in the in the street grid there. I wondered if the DIR is going to calculate, uh, given the additional what is it, 900 feet or whatever. Uh, uh, what do you, you know, ex emissions and uh, gas, uh, gas consumed, that is, you have to do all these metrics to, to, to weigh the one uh, uh, that exists now versus your, your proposed changes. And so, so what will happen here is that volume that, that comes up here at this point here, there's a lot of it that's heading to the turnpike, so it's kind of pulled it out of that intersection. But certainly there's volume that's heading back up here. We're actually continuing down Cambridge Street to come across. And then you certainly have the volume that's going back over to Cambridge. And so our analysis kind of shows those volumes and those calculations of, of how that's all going to operate. So you're, you're, you're arguing that by doing away with the ramp on the right, you are diffusing the traffic that uses it now through this, this other grid and therefore things will be better. That's one way of putting it, yeah. There's a lot of volume, like I said, 75 to 80% of the volume that takes that off ramp today is not going to Cambridge. And and I don't understand, I mean, so if you, if you funnel, the, if you retain the, the off ramp to Cambridge and you, you funnel the other traffic through that grid, like, what's the problem with the 19 feet? I mean, then, then you claim that 
well, I guess we'll get to that, then you claim that you don't gain, you don't have the theoretical gain of uh, open space. Is that it? Well, it would try to actually solve a lot of problems, not, not just a vehicular problem, but certainly make it better for the peds and the bikes. So right. part, of, part of closing that ramp there will actually provide a much wider path for the peds and bikes. Right. And so on that point, and I may be jumping the gun, but I wish you'd stop referring to it as open space. If you would refer to it as transportation infrastructure, which it is, I would be a lot happier because when I see the drawings for it, that's what I see. I don't see open space. You mean the pathway you want to yes. count as it's transportation infrastructure? Thank, Thank you. Vehicle. Peter? Speak up a little bit. Can you hear me? No, not quite. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'll try. Um, you said you only have 23 feet of width. Now, I've got my own <coughs> observation of that, and there's 33, 33 feet of width there, which would allow for a 19-foot right turn off-ramp and 14 feet of width for the bikeway. So I'm not sure that, you know, when you say 23 feet, it certainly changes the whole equation. It, it, it I don't is. think that's appropriate to do that. So it is 23 feet from it's the curb line to the curb line of what's there today. Of the roadway? Yeah. I'm talking about from the, you have to look at the width from the, basically the railing by the river on the river side of the pathway, right. the bike path, over to the other curb of the roadway. That's the width you're dealing with. But not, we, not just, you know, you can't ignore the existing. Right, but that width is occupied by the, the bike path. <laughs> well, this is going to add to the bike path. Right, so it's all part of that. 23 feet is the roadway width. Okay. And you would need 19 feet of roadway width if we were to keep that ramp open. Right. So you gain roughly four feet right. that you could add to the path. Four feet plus what's plus there. what's existing. What's existing yes. now, which yes. which from the rail to the curb is about eight feet. But you have highway, you have guardrail there, and so forth. So it's it is a very tight area for the pedestrian device. Oh, it's tight. But the point is, I think you're making it sound more constrained than it is. Just just so that the just so the data is is right. You're saying the full width they have to deal with is what you described. It's 33 feet. Yeah. I'm going to call on this gentleman here. Thank you. Um, three quick clarifying questions, please. Do I understand right that Soldiers Field will merge with 90 exit ramp traffic? Uh, that's question number one. Two. Want me to take them one at a time? Uh, sure. So the uh, you will have an yeah. on ramp here that you could come up, come up here, make a right, and another right, and you could go SFR inbound. Or the outbound move is you come up, take a right, and then you can get on the highway there. No, I was actually saying so uh, if you are eastbound on the pike and you're getting off to go to Cambridge and you're north or westbound on Soldier's Field, that traffic is actually going to merge at that yellow intersection. Am I right? So you're actually bringing two major arteries. Uh, exit arteries into each other. Am I so, right? This one here? So if you're heading eastbound, yeah. you could get off and go here. Yeah, I know that. Or you could get off at this, go over the highway, and keep going up. Okay. This here. I see, so the westbound is one, is, one lane. It's one block east. over. Yeah, okay. Understood, thank you. Uh, my next question, you, you talked about existing conditions in 2040 and how they would worsen. That is really important data that I'd like to hear you talk more about, your projections for 2040 for traffic use and congestion, congestion and idle time, which is obviously really unhealthy yep. for all neighborhoods. And if you got here uh, when I did and you saw Granite's backed up to Magazine and, and Memorial's backed up from Western all the way to the BU Bridge, and this, this is an everyday event, yeah. I want to know what this is going to do for during construction, which will be about 10 years. And what's it going to do after construction? How is it going to change the idle time? And I'm not talking about today. I want 20 years out. So I understand if we are improving efficiencies of vehicular movement so that the neighborhoods breathe a little better. Yeah, so I would say kind of what you're seeing here is the scope of the infrastructure that's being proposed. Uh, the Mass DOT is not looking to 
go across the other side of the river, make improvements to those intersections or, or, or many adjustments over there. Uh, really the focus is to address this and aging viaduct, create the urban grid um, and do that. No, I understand. Draft the IR. That, that traffic I talked about is all trying to get over the View Bridge or Western yeah, or yeah. coming in from, from River. That's right. what I'm trying to understand. Yeah, and our, so when we do our draft environmental impact report, yeah. we do a very elaborate uh, predictions of what the traffic volumes will be, yeah. the levels of service, how much delay, yeah. look at air quality issues to see if there's any kind of uh, hot spots with air quality. All that information, I mean, we're working on it. I don't have it tonight will be presented in that document. So that would also help, I think, all of us understand what schemes may be more favorable than others. If you have those projections and you show us the implications to the neighborhood 20 years out, I mean, I, I, I have a hard time evaluating these without that data, which seems so fundamental to the design. And that's why we're issuing the DEIR document, and one of the reasons why I'm going to make the current pitch um, I, Speak I up understand. Oh, I understand from Kathy. I think I'm the loudest guy in the room. I always have. Um, I understand from Kathy that she's providing her own sign-in sheets tonight. So please, everybody, if you did sign in, include an email address so that yes. we can notify you when the email or when the DEIR document comes out, so that you can see all those things and write your comment in the most informed manner possible. Thank you. Yeah. So I want to see how many people have clarifying questions. I know Henrietta. Suzanne, the gentleman here, two more over here, and we're now at 20 up, so I'm going to just have to violate five minutes of the clock time and take these questions. So, Henrietta. Okay, so uh, following up on what Marilyn said, um, could you clarify the width of the... Henrietta, can you talk about us? Could you clarify the, the width of the uh, Cloud Lovely White recreation area, transportation area, whatever we're going to call it, parkland, as it goes from the throat on the way, all the way up. I think a lot of us are concerned that this is being called parkland, but it really is too narrow to be a real park, more like a transportation. Sure. So if you could just say what the widths are, that would be helpful. Sure. So uh, we don't have, uh, I would say, kind of final widths, but what's happening in this expanded area for the open space is we're looking at a dual system, similar to what's on the Cambridge side, where you would have you know, a sidewalk and then a separate cycling facility. So there is enough width here to provide kind of dual uh, modes through that open space. Certainly kind of as you get kind of towards the end and certainly in here where it's a little bit narrower, um, it has to get back to a, a, a shared use path, a, a combined path. But where we have ability to kind of create something pretty nice for a transportation corridor for feds and bikes, we're going to try to look to have a separate, uh, you know, separated <laughs> paths. And the other uh, question is: Are you um, doing your analysis with and without West Station happening? Yes. Uh, so we'll see that uh, what transit might do to uh, all this, these traffic issues yeah. in the future. Yeah. Yes, gentlemen, there. You have your hand up. Yeah. Uh, does your analysis include? the impact of traffic leaving the turnpike on the intersection where traffic from Stowe Drive gets off and comes to a stoplight. You said 151 cars at the bridge. There's going to be turnpike traffic coming off there from going west, coming into that intersection. Basically, I believe what you're doing is shifting the traffic jam that occurs already that comes in behind Embassy Suite or whatever it's called now, and it all jams up there. And whereas if you leave the ramp there, that right turn would be separated traffic and would be metered in a different place. You've got both of those streams of traffic come together. You have to do some analysis of the impact of that. Yeah, and our analysis will look at how those new volumes kind of get repurposed and they get certainly get shifted around and that's kind of how we look at each intersection how it operates the delay uh, level of service and that is all again kind of reported in the document and that's the stuff we're going through now did you have a question yes um, is there any plan of more intelligent traffic lighting technology so that they're synchronized and changed 
based on traffic load as opposed to just being on timers? Absolutely, yep. We are, uh, MassDOT is very open to more progressive uh, timing of the lights. We work with the city of Boston. Uh, you know, from, from this point, kind of this is Cambridge Street South, from this point all the way up here, those, that's really city of Boston network. Uh, so we work with BTD to kind of work through those issues. From Cambridge Street South, as you, you get close to the turnpike, those are mascot facilities and signals and so forth. So the DOT and the city is open up to, to optimizing the signals as best they can. But, do, but are they actually signals that could change based on what's happening at a given point? Yes, they are. Okay. Glenn and then this gentleman. Let's take this gentleman first and then you, Glenn. Okay, so I just want to clarify. If I'm coming from Boston on so, uh, into Soldiers Field Road, I want to go to, basically, my, I go, want to get to River Street to come home here at Cambridge Okay. You're saying, I think what you de the design is to get off, to get to uh, Cambridge Street South and then go up. Is that's that off ramp you were just talking about? That's right here. Right there. Okay. Right. I can still drive home from the airport. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll just take a look. Come up here and right. That's that 860, 900 foot extra Right. Uh, I just want to uh, ask a couple of clarifying questions on this issue of the right turn. Um, if, uh, Nate, can we go to the slide where you showed the closing of the right turn? Chris has clicked. Yeah, I'm sure he'll take it there. Uh, yeah, that's one. Yeah, that's great. Thank okay. you. So, um, and Jack, just to clarify, when you said all three options close the right turn, that's my understanding. Um, Is that yes, right? Yes, but but just I, I want to like help clarify. We never discussed that separately within the options. This proposal uh, was presented to the task force as part of 3K, and we were never discussed, as far as I remember, any options to this. So I happen to think there's a lot of good things about this option. Um, so it's much more fun to be sitting in the chair here than to be up in Chris's position, certainly uh, with a lot of the questions in this room. But my clarifying question is, is the state saying that this is the only way that you can improve that crummy Paul Dudley white width as it approaches River Street? Because it's not the only way you could do it. A second way you could do it is right where that dashed white line is, you could keep Soldiers Field Road down in a boat section since you're already creating a new boat section, and you could deck over that boat section and allow the right turn to basically stay on top of Soldiers Field Road, and you could widen the Paul Dudley White and still keep the right turn. They don't have to conflict with each other. And then the third way you could do it as a clarifying question, is, <laughs> is there's ways, there's, a, there's advocacy going on to get the Paul Dudley White on the Boston side to have great separations at all the major bridges. And the one that I've seen, at least on the internet, here at this bridge, actually would take the Paul Dudley White on a little boardwalk out over the river itself and go under the bridge. And if you did that, you might not even need to do anything else and could still keep the right turn. And I'm not trying to advocate through my point of clarification which of those three I just mentioned would be preferable. But shouldn't, shouldn't the state admit there's more than one option to make things better for bikes that you don't have to do something that some people perceive as bad for cars? And why wouldn't the state evaluate more than just one option in its DIR. <clears throat> so I will say this, that all of the three throat options really are separate and independent of what happens with the River Street off-ramp. Um, I would also point out that, you know, there are ideas about <coughs> trying to go out into a boardwalk or what Glenn puts out as far as trying to deck things over. Um, there is kind of scope that DOT has to live with to make this project happen. Um, this idea actually came to DOT and the public through the placemaking <coughs> study that was fully vetted with the city, with the public, and so forth. 
the this city was, of Boston. City of Boston. This was one of the major recommendations. Um, and this is what we are studying in the draft EIR. Whether this ends up this way, I can't tell you that, but this is what we're prepared to study. We have to put something forward in the draft EIR. This is what we're looking to put forward in the draft EIR. So let's, we'll come back to your question in the discussion time, because it raises a process question. And is there an opportunity to present one or more alternatives on how to deal with the horrors of the River Street Bridge, um, which we all experience? So I'd like to move on now to noise. Yes, Suzanne. Just uh, related, if the off-ramp stayed and only served right turns, no left, no through, how long would it have to be? Yeah. Much Can shorter than today. The you, well, the I ramp said, itself. If it stayed, if the off-ramp stayed and it only served right turns to Cambridge, no left, no through, how long would it have to be? And, and then I added, much shorter than today, but I don't, I don't know how long. I don't either. Okay, so that, the length of the that's, a, that's yeah. a question. The length of the it, it would be the same length because right now where it starts, the underpass starts going down, so it wouldn't, you wouldn't need that much, but, but that's how long it up with that much. All right, let's move on to noise. And welcome. Quantat. Quantat. So this is the advance of the light, or you can do that. Good evening. Uh, my name is Quantat, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the fundamentals of noise and then uh, a little bit about the process for the noise uh, evaluation. Your voice doesn't carry completely. Okay, so I'll speak up. Or here's the mic. See if you can make it work. Good luck to you. <laughs> can you hear me now? Uh, How about now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, to give you a little background on sort of the fundamentals of noise, uh, noise is uh, not linear. Uh, it's more uh, logarithmic. So, uh, adding two noise sources of, uh, of similar levels, such as 50 plus 50, we do not end up with 100 uh, decibels. We essentially end up with like 53 decibels. Uh, for this study, we focused on looking at the uh, uh, loudest hour, which typically does not equate to the peak hour traffic conditions, uh, just because with more traffic and congestion, the speeds are lower, which reduces the sound levels as well. So um, uh, the FHWA and MassDOS policy looks at the, the LEQ levels for noise impacts, uh, which is essentially the equivalent uh, represents the equivalent uh, acoustic energy for a, a certain time period. So, uh, for, high, for highway noise, uh, we're concerned about three sources associated with uh, essentially vehicles. Uh, you've got your exhaust noise, you've got your engine noise, and then you also got the wheel or tire to the pavement or rail noise uh, component. So there's essentially three components to, to highway noises. Uh, for both highway and rail noise, the, the, the main factor uh, contributing to noise sources are typically your volume, uh, the speed that they're traveling in, uh, uh, the number of trucks for highway noises, um, and the distance between the, your noise source, your roadway, and your receptor location. Uh, because the, the factor with that is that uh, acoustical energy actually dissipates as you get further away. So. Um, and then the geometry of the study area, uh, in the intervening uh, hills or terrain uh, could act as a barrier and shield, you, shield the receptors from uh, noise sources. So just to simplify the process of, of the noise study, there's, in my view, there's sort of three processes. Uh, the first is we do uh, noise measurements to establish uh, existing conditions existing conditions uh, and the data collected is also used to uh, develop the noise model. Um, yes. Better? Yes. Uh, so for this study we've actually did measurements 
both in Alston and in Cambridge uh, to help uh, establish the existing conditions uh, and to, to get a better understanding of what's happening on, out there now. Um, the measurements were done in, to represent various different land uses, the parks, the residences, um, essentially any of the open uh, spaces that we could set up our uh, monitors to, to conduct the data. So, for, so once we collect the data, we would develop a traffic noise model and, and sort of predict the sound levels for the existing condition at a lot more uh, receptive locations than we would have measured. Um, representing ground level to up, up, upper levels if there was uh, open space where, or uh, balconies where there's outdoor uses. Um, once we once we evaluate the existing nation, we would develop a future uh, model uh, representing the future alignments and, and terrain. Um, and once we develop that, we look, we'll look at that, the predicted sound levels and determine if there's an impact based on uh, MassDOT's uh, policy, noise abatement policy. Um, <laughs> Cut the noise abatement policy is to turn off the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> So um, it's it's cutting in and out. It's not here. I'll try to speak up loud. Things mess it up. Looks like this is not working. Uh, so for the impact study, we we're going to look at the various uh, uh, alignments, I guess, uh, associated with the the, the throat alternatives. Um, we. The future roadway uh, model will, uh, will incorporate all the alignment changes, the elevation changes, any sort of geometry in the study area that, that will change based on the, the, the proposed alignments. Um, once we do that, we would determine if there's impacts. If there's impacts, we would need to look at mitigation measures uh, to abate the, the uh, high levels. Um, and as part of the abatement <coughs> process, um, if the barrier is determined to be evaluated, we need to look at a feasibility and reasonableness criteria based on uh, MassDOT's policy. Uh, with that, there's several factors that go into it. There's the constructability uh, factor where can we build a, a barrier in this location? Uh, is there safety concerns or site distance issues that we need to uh, be concerned about? Uh, are there cross streets that we can build a continuous barrier to be effective? Um, then there's the cost criteria where we take into consideration the sound level reduction uh, based uh, due to the wall, uh, the, the height of the wall, the cost at, at the end of the wall, and that goes into a format that determines uh, if it meets MassDOT's criteria. Uh, we got to make sure that the noise wall is uh, effective. Uh, so based on MassDOT's policy, we need to achieve at least five decibels of reduction for a majority of the uh, receptors that have been benefited. Uh, the wall also needs to be uh, able to provide at least a 10 decibel reduction for a front row receptor, at least one of them, to be considered effective. Uh, we also take into consideration the property, the abutters property owners, uh, to see if they want the wall. Uh, some folks don't like it because it, it uh, impacts their garden or the, the visual aspects of it that uh, the, the, they're concerned about. And that's the end of the noise uh, presentation. All right, questions about noise. Henrietta. I think um, some of the things that you were referencing are not Cambridge oriented. So there are no property owners who are have walls that might be near those. So, so I wondered if you can be more specific about um, what you're looking at in terms of the kind of noise that we are experiencing here. And that is, I mean, I'll characterize what, what I know, which is on the third floor of our house today, we could hear the individual motorcycles going on in that third bike, one by one, one by one. And you can hear the individual trucks as they make their way down uh, because there's no more, uh, they have to go through this windy way to slow down to get outbound to Newton. So we can hear the vehicles one by one. Um, that can be day and night, depends on which way the wind is blowing. But I, what I don't hear in your presentation is anything that's specific to the kind of noise 
or the areas that we're concerned about or the kind of abatement that what would be a, would be possible so, related to this neighborhood specifically? So the noise abatement criteria is created uh, to essentially abate noise uh, the levels created so that it allows people to have a, a sort of normal conversation in their backyard essentially. It, it's not really geared to reduce the noise to the point where you can't hear it. So even though you, we might build a noise barrier for places that are impacted, you still might be able to still hear the highway noise on the other side of the wall, but it, it reduces to the levels so that it's below the what FHWA and MassDOT consider as a noise impact uh, level. So for residential areas, the level is set at 66, an absolute level of 66 decibels. So if we model that, for instance, Cambridgeport gets, uh, receives a 66, we would say that, all right, you guys are impacted. We would look at a, a, a wall and see how much reduction we could get um, uh, associated with the, the proposed wall uh, to get you levels below 66. It's not necessary to reduce it so you can't hear it. Um, so, yeah. so even though you could hear the sort of the, the motorcycle noise, the jaybreaking associated with the, the traffic, it might not be loud enough to trigger an impact for them to value. So, if a wall is designed, it's actually designed more to reduce levels from you know a high, uh, say 77 or below the, the 66. So, I guess so. what concerns me here, um, I have to use a trick from one. How does this work, Glenn? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Your clarifying question. My, clar my clarifying question <laughs> is: um, is the kind of noise that the people who are here who are concerned about noise, is that at all addressed in the EIR, or are we barking up the wrong tree? Are you modeling Cambridgeport? We are. The, we have a whole area in Cambridgeport that will be included as well. What, what I consider receptor locations. Uh, so, if we even if you guys weren't impacted in receptors elsewhere that are impacted, shows that they're impacted, we would actually evaluate the study area for barriers to see where barriers are feasible and reasonable. Well, well I so, guess maybe we need to know is it, it, you've done some things already, right? So we've only, I've actually personally haven't been really involved. Yeah. The person that, that's been involved actually was called home for a uh, personal emergency situation, so I actually haven't been heavily involved with this particular project. Uh, but from my understanding, they've done the existing condition, did the measurements, did the existing conditions, and they're in the process of actually evaluating the future roadway alignments and the alternatives that, that are presented already. Uh, and they haven't, he hasn't gotten the results on that yet. So they're still in the process of that. And as Jack mentioned and, and Nate mentioned, that will be presented as part of the EIR uh, report. So I, I have two uh, clarifying question. Two weeks ago, the ABC alternative that was everything at grade, rail and okay. highway, showed a Soldiers Field Road elevated, I think about four feet or so, above the pipe mm -hmm. as a partial noise barrier for the tires of the pipe that they couldn't wouldn't have a free shot at the river and across the river. Are you taking that into consideration? Are you looking at the refinement of the all upgrade plan and its noise impact? Yeah, I can answer that. So that actually is reflected in the kind of the geometry that's being part of study part of that noise analysis. So that it geometry is will be incorporated. Correct. Because it's not in your in your initial slides yet. Co correct. It's yeah. it's it's a recent uh, that ABC has kind of put that out there to raise that up a few feet to help mitigate some of the noise. That's being part of, that's being incorporated as part of that, uh, part of that option. And do you have an instinct as a noise expert <laughs> on whether that will make a significant difference? If the roadway, if Soldier's Field Road is above and the I high 90 is lower, but yes. um, I guess is the elevated section of Soldier's Field Road a fill component? Yeah, yes. it's filled. So that would act as a barrier. And, and essentially abate your noise associated with the tire. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, Tat, just to the point that Henrietta raised, you would do something for the tires. Would it, again, if you feel comfortable supposing, would it do something for the truck exhaust? Would it do something for the motorcycle engines? Yeah, I mean, uh, 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 a situation where your roadway is and is filled, 
that's essentially to me a, a barrier. It's not. A, it's a structural uh, blockage where you're you're essentially preventing the sound wave to travel through. So w with that in place, you're going to end up blocking um, all the sound waves that would be coming from the tire or your exhaust. Uh, from the roadway uh, vehicles. And is your analysis going to look at the impact of trucks going up and yes. down yep. from the viaduct? Yes. It, it, it would. It would be considering the the elevation changes along the the line of the roadway. Okay. So we'll take into consideration the acceleration and deceleration associated with the inclines. Thank you. Yes, the woman. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, since that's the first time I heard that there are going to be two tracks on the Grand Junction Railroad, when it's always been said there could only be one, are you also going to estimate what the sound is going to be? Because even now, I can hear the, the trains blowing and you know them going by, but there aren't that many of them. If there are going to be two tracks, there are going to be a lot of tiny the, so the two track configuration that we showed this evening is actually accommodations for the second track. This project doesn't construct a second track that goes across the river. Okay, so we allow for that to happen in the future with the configuration of the highway or whatever happens in that throat. We have the provisions to accommodate that in the future. So it's okay. not constructed. What I'm saying is since you have the provisions to accommodate that, can you accommodate for the noise that that's going to create and estimate what kind of noise? The, the, noise, the noise assessment will incorporate the rail component as well, uh, not just look at the highway, but it'll incorporate both the highway and noise components. Yeah. yeah, when you were recording decibel levels in Cambridgeport, so why were you only doing it at grade and not like at second and third story levels? Typically, grade level will get you the, the most accurate because that's where the noise sources are typically are. Because as, as you get away from your your noise sources, you you allow more interference, I guess per se, um, with the actual measurement of the direct noise sources. So we typically like to do ground level. Uh, it's always it used to be FHW's policy to to only look at ground level. Uh, it's more recent that they, uh, they are requesting that we look at upper levels, and we only typically look at upper levels if there's sort of actual uses like a balcony. Uh, but they don't, you just have a window, they don't consider protecting. The, the policy really only looks at uh, outdoor uh, frequent use areas. There are quite a few balconies looking at. So, well, also, I think it's a valley. I mean, that's the issue, really. So, we've got a valley, right? It's a river valley. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we are going to be hearing more noise higher up. So, but you still have a direct line of sight uh, to the highway right now. So to me, if you can see the highway, you're going to hear the highway. So as long as you have that visibility or that, that line of sight between your source and your receptor, you'll, you'll experience the, you'll get the full um, experience from it. So if, if your, your ground level is, is below, for instance, if you're familiar with I-93 in Medford, where they just got noise wall. We did measure up in uh, balcony level, knowing the fact that we were depressed at, at that situation because of the, the holes were low there and the highway was up here. So we, we recognize that there is a difference there because it doesn't have that direct line of sight. So we ended up doing measurements up at second or third floor balconies and got permissions from residents to do so. So for your area in Cambridgeport, you're actually still able to see the, the noise sources. And that's why doing it at ground level is, is sufficient enough. Uh, so let me see who has questions on noise. Let me just see all the hands and we'll see. We're done, Jack, so if you do the presentation, it's pretty much it. So if you want to just go to general questions. No, I don't. Feel like Thank you. You. <laughs> <laughs> Chris and I were just I'm gonna discussing it. Stick with the structure here. Oh, okay. Kathy. Uh, so what I want to understand is, so the river, so what is the function? You're a noise expert. So we've got this flat river. So is the at grade, uh, what are we going to hear? What's going to be louder? Something that's at grade? It sounds like sunken is really going to be quieter. Yeah, or a viaduct. And could you have a viaduct with walls? I mean, is the, I, I've heard that the sound is still going to, like you can't control raised sound, right? Or how is the river going to impact the, 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 the solution chosen? So if the river was actually grass, you might have better 
you would probably experience lower levels if it was that gray, just because grass actually act as an absorber of sound waves. Because think about traffic traveling and then it hits grass, it actually gets caught in grass. Uh, so most of the, some of the sound waves doesn't get to travel across the river. Uh -huh. But if it's water, which we consider what we call a hot source, it would just actually reflect off of it, so your sound will still travel. So being river or water, being elevated on at, gra at the ground grade level doesn't really make a whole lot of difference for, for your area just because of the, that situation. But if it was going over open grass in plant, I would say that the at grade would probably be more beneficial because it, the grass itself, because we call that soft ground, it, it actually reduces that at a faster rate than uh, what we call hard ground. Because the, in hard ground, it sideways actually reflect and it gets to travel further. Yes. Yes, thank you. So um, where, so the point is that 6 to 6 dBA, is it? Yep. Uh, wherever you measure it, if that's the reading, then the noise barrier is warranted. So not necessary measure, but model. We will do measurements at various locations, take that data back. So as part of the measurements, we typically do traffic counts. Uh, in correlation to it so that when we go back to the office and develop our noise model, we know, we know kind of what issues were out there when we measured. So we'll use that data and develop uh, uh, what we call a calibrated model for the existing conditions. Uh, with that model, we will end up putting the actual real traffic uh, representing the peak, loud, peak hour or loudest hour. Uh, based on that, we'll, based on, on that, that data, we'll look at and see if it's impacted. Then we'll take the model, tweak it, or, or adjust it to reflect the future geometry of the study area based on the future volume as well. And this is sort of the debate in the noise world. Do you use peak hour traffic or do you use traffic conditions that are volumes that are a little bit less because at peak hour, you really have that congestion phase where your, tr your travel speeds are lower. So therefore, your sound levels end up being lower. So you kind of want, the loudest hour typically represents when you have high volumes with three full speeds. Yeah. But, but where, where are the measurements taking place? It's the first step. It's taken at various locations that we would determine will help us develop our model. And, and where is 66 DBA? So that, when we model the future of the condition, wherever the receptors uh, that we, we evaluated shows a 66 or more. Then, then, what, then what happened? Then you were looking to mitigation measures or abatement yeah. measures. So, so you're not saying that, if, that the noise level in Cambridge Court has to be 66 before you... It would have to be, a, be at 66 for us to look at. Well, not necessarily, I guess. In depending Cambridgeport. In Cambridgeport or, or, I guess, receptors that might be closer than are facing the same I'm sorry, I have to tell you that I live, uh, you know, right next to a lab building. So the, the noise ordinance in Cambridge sets 50 dBA for nighttime and 60 for, for daytime. I can tell you that 50 dBA, even marginally more, 55, renders our backyards unusable. We don't, we don't go outside anymore. Um, and that's and that's from a building that's very close. So I don't understand what the utility of the 66 measure is for Cambridge Court. I, I, I'm having a hard time understanding. I mean, that's the threshold that the federal uh, government and, and mass yeah, has adopted. Yeah, I understand that, that, but I don't know how it. I mean, it sounds like it. You know, good luck to. That's all. Yeah, you're questioning I mean, the validity of the assumptions. Well, no, I mean, analogy. that is the standard. The Cambridge Noise Ordinance is inadequate to the, to the task at hand now. It hasn't been updated. But it sounds like this is, is really something. I'm going to park that question. We'll come back to it. Glenn uh, hi, and hi, Ari. Hi. And then you have it. Kind of those last three on noise. I have a final question on um, the existing condition that was recorded for noise coming off of uh, the mass pipe. Do we know approximately when you took the noise measurements for the existing condition? And I have a quick follow-up. When you say when you talk about seasonal or, uh, or that 
during the day. Oh, uh, uh, thank you. Bill. What approximately what month of what year did was? You I believe they did several series of measurements uh, uh, throughout the year. I'm not. I don't know, know off the top of my head what those uh, periods were. I know they did it mostly during uh, what we consider a peak period, which is typically one to four in the afternoon to capture that sort of period before it becomes the peak, uh, PM peak rush hour. Does anyone else on the team happen to know what quarter or what year they took the existing? No, I mean, Quant's filling in for somebody, Glenn, so, you know, we, we, he doesn't have the exact date and time for that information. So Did you get that information for... So, uh, so, uh, so, look, so Jack, the, the quick follow-up is that um, up until recently, every vehicle driving on the Mass Pike presumably had to slow down to go through a toll plaza. And now no one has to slow down to go through the toll plaza. And three or four times in this single presentation, the gentleman referenced that you have higher noise when it's not rush hour congestion when vehicles are traveling at faster speeds. And so the clarifying question is just to verify that the existing condition that they use is post taking down the tolls so that we reflect uh, uh, presumably a higher noise I, I, could, I could actually respond to that point, that, that component of it. They originally did an assessment based on uh, the roadway, existing roadway with the tolls, but once the AET system went in place, they actually revised their existing condition to reflect the, the new new roadway system, so. Thank you. All right, last. Yeah, the, uh, the car bike question I would ask is you said that uh, with a lower profile roadway, if there were grass, it would be a better situation to absorb more of the noise. And then the question there is how Magazine Beach, which is sort of a buffer between the river and, and Cambridge Port, plays into that. Um, and whether that would, would how that would change it. That's about the same width as, as the river, but it's a grassy area and has trees to break up. I mean, that, that's incorporated into the model. We, uh, we essentially put water as a water. A component in the of the river into as a water component, and any grass area we would consider grass. So, as the model predicts, it knows that it's going over what we consider hard, and uses a different formula. But once it crosses a soft terrain or the grass area, it would adjust and calculate it. Yeah, and I guess the second question is to sort of a, a clarify the thing is that in Cambridge Port, so when you cross the river, some of the houses are up on about a 10 or 15 foot hill, so that is higher generally three-story houses, so the second and third stories that face the river, uh, and older housing stock that a lot of people have open windows um, and bedrooms. And so, you know, I, I know that maybe generally we're looking at the, the F, F, FHWA says don't look at that, but I think that this is the case where really we need to look at the actual uses that we have thousands of people who have bedrooms that face out onto this, you know, so we, onto this, so we really should measure up there where the noise isn't broken up by the as much by the park net, by the treescape, by the, the, the streetscape, by the, the buildings line there, but it sort of comes more across on a on a on a line of sight. Because that's the line of sight you can't really see the turnpike from the from any of the street level, but you can see it from a lot of the floor. Last noise comment and then we're gonna have concluding slides and then open it up. This is a clarifying question. It's about <laughs> You mentioned that the decibel scale is logarithmic, and I just wanted to be clear, is it correct that every one additional decibel is 10 times the noise level? Uh, 10 times the noise level? No, it's, a, it's 10 times the acoustical energy, okay. but not necessarily 10 times the noise level. But the fact that it's logarithmic, I mean, it sort of underscores Marilyn's point that the difference between 50 and 55 is not 10%. Correct. It's a much, much larger difference with every increase in DB. Yeah. Yeah. So to get twice as loud, you need 10 decibels of increase, essentially. If anything less than 3 decibels is not perceivable. So that kind of shows you the sort of the logarithmic scale where it's not a linear. So being through less than 3, you can't even hear the change. Being 10, you can hear a doubling of the, of the, of the sound. So, so to get things that sound twice as loud, you would need to have 10 decibels of increase. Thank you very much. Yeah. And if you'll hold on for a second. Chris, some concluding thoughts, and then we'll we're, uh, wide open. We're really wrapped. I think the only other slide left was uh, just kind of a rough timeline. Uh, shows you kind of that we're in this environmental, you know, permit filing, looking at that draft EIR. 
mentioned earlier, schedule is to get this filed in the fall. Uh, and then that's when we expect to that documents open for public comment. We can hear, hear all your comments, all your letters. All that stuff kind of weighs in and helps the DOT uh, kind of move forward with the next phase, which is the final environmental impact report. And that helps guide us uh, to, to what will be ultimately advanced into a preliminary design uh, component. And then this project does go, uh, I would mention that it goes into what's called the design build type of project where they advance this project to a kind of a 25% level. It goes out for a procurement to select a design designer and a contractor. They team together and do the final design and construction. So uh, those are kind of some of the next steps that we have uh, going forward. And we're into uh, any questions and comments. All right, we have half hour. Uh, we need to be out by 10 minutes of 9, is that correct? I want to allow a couple minutes at the end for any concluding comments from Henrietta and Bill um, and Council. Thank you. Um, so I'm not a noise expert or transportation expert. We've got some great questions from people here. But when I ask residents of Cambridge to go through a four or five year construction project, um, there's usually some tangible benefit at the end for them. Um, I hear that, you know, I, a previous meeting I, I attended, Alston's going to get all kinds of improvements and benefits. The, the folks in Cambridgeport are going to go through the construction, the noise, the upheaval, everything else, and I'm hearing that nothing's going to be done on our side of the river in terms of improvements. I can't even get the pathway along Memorial Drive paved so that runners aren't twisting their ankles on it. What's, what's the benefit to the people of Cambridge here? What, what can you do to at least say, yes, you're going to be put through a lot, but at the end of the day, this is going to be better for you? So I'm not hearing a whole lot of benefit for, for us. Well, I think the noise is a to be determined. I think, you know, we're, we're, let's not kind of just jump out and say nothing's going to happen on the noise side. Uh, in all fairness, they still have to do their, their work for the noise. Uh, you know, as far as the traffic situation, kind of what's happening on the Boston side of the river. We all know that intersection in River Street and, and, uh, and Soldersfield Road is horrendous. Yep. The backup's trying to get to Cambridge, et cetera. You know, we're looking to improve that. So, you know, those folks that want to travel uh, to Cambridge, we're hoping that's a better situation uh, to get into Cambridge. And same thing kind of coming out. Um, that, you know, what's there today is really aged infrastructure uh, for that interchange and create a more uh, urban street grid that's, that's more reflective of today's type of approach. So I kind of understand where you're coming from, but it is, it, is a, uh, it is a Boston interchange and kind of what happens on the other side, um, we're sensitive to that, but the, the scope of the project as far as adding infrastructure we're not sure what that would really mean or what that would be. The gentleman right back there behind Steve. No, not Steve. <laughs> Steve is next. Yes, I'm from Cambridge. And if, even if there's no tangible benefits to Cambridge and there's benefits for the general population of Boston and the world, I'm for it. Okay, Mark. I agree. Well, I also I also think it will also benefit as if someone who lives in Cambridgeport. There are a lot of us who run around the river or bike around the river, and so those sections of parkland that, or uh, transportation infra infrastructure that will be added that will make it easier or less dangerous for us, for example, at that River Street Bridge, will greatly benefit me in terms of getting in and out of Cambridge on foot or on a bike. I don't have a clarifying question. I have a comment. No, we're no, in the open comments, comments, comments now. Go ahead, All right? I'm obeying the rules. Um, what I'm going to do is I have many questions on, on uh, traffic, um, and I'd like to suggest as a general idea that the traffic study should be done by Harvard. Harvard is going to be generating 7 million square feet of development. They're the generator of the new traffic. So they should take responsibility for it. But I've got some detailed questions. What I'll do is I'll write um, to the chief engineer and put them in writing. Um, I've also got major concerns about the status of public transit, transit servicing this area. This should be transit-oriented development, and it is not. So I will put that in my comment letter as well. 
One last suggestion is on the noise presentation. It was fascinating because it was the hardest one to hear. <laughs> and I'm losing my hearing, so if I lose 10% of his words, I could be completely deaf. I've lost everything he had said. He had a bad mic. We had a bad mic on March 30th, too. We've got to get the electronics working. This is a splendid room for, for noise. This is a noise meter. I bought it at Radio Shack. This, has, this room has background noise levels of 40 decibels. It's beautiful. Even less, 38. The library has about 50. And when you speak, without the microphone, you're only doing 55 decibels. So it's very, very hard to hear. Now, Jack is a lawyer. I can hear him very well. So please bring it, buy one of these things, bring it in here and say, OK, I'm measuring 40 decibels. That's the noise level. That's what 40 is. And then when you speak, you say, this is 50. And when you shout, it's 65. It's better than showing a chart. Thank you. Yes, right over here. Uh, Robert Lecture and Roy, I've got uh, 40 years of environmental search in Cambridge and did a lot of uh, transportation work. The, you talk about the left turn off the ramp. I addressed that in your private meetings, and you responded to that very well. The left turn is a nightmare. The right turn, you admit, is nothing. So what you're taking is a situation which is nothing from your point of view and causing a real problem for Cambridge residents. Because Cambridge residents go from a boulevard to an off-ramp to the mass bike. That's not good. Environmental issues. Um, these, oh, oh, and I support your plan except for that. These alternate plans would destroy habitat along the river. Um, the plans I've seen have highways and rails going into Cambridge, which strikes me as very destructive. And particularly, I know one pointed out the destruction of the thick woods between the Grand Junction and the boathouse. At the same time, we're getting noise about bike highways over the Grand Junction Bridge, widening the Grand Junction Bridge. The reality is, in 2003, the MBTA did a study in which the MBTA proved that you can get off ramp from the, from the Mass Pike to Cambridge over the widened Grand Junction Bridge. The reality is, how long will that so-called bike path continue when MIT wants its own private off ramp? Thank you. All right, let's see all the people who'd like to comment. We've got six or eight, so we're going to end this discussion at uh, 8.45 because we need to be out of the building by 8.50. Is that right? Okay. So, Glenn. Well, just a quick comment to, to the good counselor and, and, um, in your issue that you raised. Uh, I didn't grow up here, but I, I was one of those people who was fortunate to come here for grad school. And I remember it was a Sunday in uh, 1984. I had a full head of hair, and um, uh, I didn't know, you know, that uh, uh, I didn't know anything other than uh, I got off at this exit, uh, and it was my entrance to this whole region. And it was a Sunday afternoon, and it was the Red Sox game, and and. Uh, I, I thought it was the craziest, worst designed exit from the interstate I'd ever taken in my life. And I grew up in New York. Yeah. And um, uh, I, really, I'm in the Athens of America, and this is what existed. And, and to defend the project here, um, uh, what they're going to do uh, uh, is make the exit from the Pike to Cambridge, at least that move, be a hell of a lot safer, I think, and a, and, a, and a much more nicer experience than any of us have experienced, you know, since it opened in 19, uh, 
62, I think it was, or 64, or something like that. And, and just that by itself, I would say, is, is, a, is a major benefit for Cambridge. All right, let's see who hasn't spoken yet. James. Um, so thank you. I'm sorry I got here late. I was at a premiere screening of the Vietnam documentary that will be released in September, so <laughs> don't ask me about it. <laughs> um, I think there are some positive things, as I understand them, about the project. But I just, I think the idea of lowering, I, I don't know that the decision has been made, but the idea of lowering the elevated portion of the turnpike would be a positive uh, step. Um, and I, I, I think that's maybe one of the ones that's still not um, decided as much as some of the others. Um, I like the idea of having the uh, amenity on the other side of the river expanded uh, to be a, a more pleasant experience for pedestrians and for people on bicycles um, <coughs> by widening it. And I, uh, I also uh, have had a chance to look at and actually visit that intersection where people come up uh, off Star Drive up, up that ramp to the River Street Bridge. And uh, I know there are concerns from people in Cambridge about uh, you know, this move to the left and then going back around where the hotel currently is, um, that that's going to be as bad or worse. But as it was explained to me, and as I went and examined it, I realized some things about that intersection that I didn't appreciate, like, for example, that you have traffic coming left off that ramp. On a, there's a section of the bridge where you have actually traffic going in both directions in the same space. It's, it's crazier than I ever appreciated. And at, when it was explained to me, I, thought, I think I had a better appreciation for how the proposed redirection is going to be both positive for opening up some space for pedestrians and bikes, people on bikes, but also isn't going to be so bad and might actually be an improvement for people in their vehicles who want to get over the bridge to Cambridge. And what I would ask you all to do is to take seriously people's concerns and to address them and have, and, get, and there may have been something of, of, on this point earlier that I missed, but to work with people to explain carefully what the current status of that of that intersection and those conflicts it is, and explain how it is that that's going to be mitigated by this proposal. Otherwise, you're going to have a lot of people scratching their heads, upset, worried, legitimately absent a more careful explanation of that intersection. We did. And, and we my did last spend about 15 minutes. Good. And my last observation is there have been a lot of great ideas put forward that I don't think have yet been integrated into the plans. And um, I think Ari, sitting here, for example, has been somebody who's been involved in this idea of decking a piece of uh, highway and doing a high line kind of idea. And I would just ask you, on behalf of some of us who live here and think there are some positive things that could come out of this, including 20 feet of landfill to expand the, uh, the, the land on the other side, to look at all those ideas, to be open to all of those ideas so that we could have a, the best possible solutions here. Thanks. Let me see all the hands of people who would like to make a comment. Um, we have two, four, six, so, so, yes. Thank you. Um, Frank Shirley, 75 Henry Street. Uh, I live in a house that's uh, quite near to the river. I have unobstructed views from second and third floor. Um, on noise, to be candid with you, it actually isn't a particular concern for my family, even though we are so close to the river. The noise is worse at probably 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night, mainly because of the trucks, and you can hear them decelerating. Um, we don't have air conditioning, so all our windows are open in the summer. And it is low on our concern list with this, with, with this project. Um, that's just one person talking, but the noise doesn't affect us in terms of our concern um, compared to other things. What does have me concerned is there's been no talk about what the traffic studies, what the traffic implications will be for the duration of this project. And you said it's five years. I personally have no faith that it will be done in five years because there's no track record of the DOT completing projects on time, be it from 
Big Pig to the Longfellow Bridge. We can't even seem to get an extension on the Green Line done at this point. So I expect this project to be a seven to 10 year project, especially because you're doing design build and that's always going to that have certain risks associated. For, for the seven to 10 years that this is ongoing, what is, where is traffic going when Soldier Field is shut down or sections of the pipe are shut down? All of these other things are happening. What happens to Cambridge Port? Afterwards, I did mention this in my uh, clarification question earlier, earlier, what are the traffic implications to our side of the river? I know you're not doing work on the side of the river, but these changes will affect us and understand at least something I'm particularly sensitive to is Memorial Drive, the BU Rotary, Sydney Street and its extension, Putnam Avenue and Western Avenue back up for many, many blocks from about 4 o'clock until 7, 7.30 later if it's a Red Sox game. It's a really big deal. What happens for the seven plus years during construction to all of that? What happens after all this is done? Uh, Mr. McGovern said something about what are you doing for us? I just want to know, you hopefully have done traffic studies, what is going to happen to our community in terms of these vehicles backing up, idling, and the pollution goes with it? Chris. You know, I, I think uh, I wish there was kind of like one answer to say, yeah, this is exactly what's going to happen during construction. Uh, honestly, we have to look at the whole project, look at the areas. We do, DOT does take seriously how much, uh, you know, construction traffic and how that affects the neighborhood, cut through traffic, et cetera. Um, there will be some, uh, depending on, on uh, which alternative is chosen in the throat, there could be some outages, maybe not. Uh, but I-90, for instance, uh, was, was going to be reduced down to three lanes in each direction, as an example. That was something that was done for the construction of the ComEV substructure work. So, you know, there will be some uh, elements that, you know, we have to kind of squeeze things down and make it work. Uh, Soldiers Field Road, for instance, we're not looking to take that out of service. We're not looking to do, uh, you know, any extensive... Uh, you know, taking that out of service, maybe uh, late at night, we could be some lane closures, but nothing uh, elaborate there. So I understand your point, but at this point, we don't have a solution that says, yes, exactly, this is what's going to happen, you know, during construction at this location. All of this is kind of taken into consideration as we advance the project even well beyond the draft EIR and into the final, you know, preliminary and final design. So to the extent you can do it, the implication of the question is get it into the draft impact report so people can react yeah to it. You know, and I, I would say see some of that level that kind of level of detail actually happens after the draft environmental impact report you know we're trying to disclose kind of all the options and ideas and so forth uh, some of the things that happen you know really down to that find out level occur after we get through the draft environmental impact report so but can the public still affect the Absolutely. decisions of the design after that report has yes. been filed because yes. I find that to be crucial to evaluating these options. Yeah. We, there's you. so many other things, you know, we've got the draft environmental impact report, there's uh, scoping sessions for that, we have the final in, in, uh, impact report, we've got federal highway filings to go through their process, uh, we've got preliminary design hearings, there's a lot of um, opportunity for more comment as this project moves forward. Renata, did you have your hand up? Yes, I did. Thank you. <coughs> uh, um, question of Mike McGovern, what will Cambridge benefit from? I think Cambridge will benefit to have this big open space along the river because this is a new city on the river. So to have a, a smaller sibling counterpart like us in Beach will be a great benefit to Cambridge because there can be events on the river, on the parklands, so that will be a benefit to Cambridge. And I hope you will push that beyond the 2.4 acres that this is a real open space and that will be a benefit to Cambridge as well, as well as to Harvard and all the residents. The other point that you brought up at River Street I, I would like MassDOT to look at how the, an underpass for pedestrians and bicyclists at the River Street would help. Because you're looking at to gain a little bit more space, but people will still have to fight 
as they cross River Street, bikes and pedestrians, that problem is not solved. You know that we're working on that at the Anderson Bridge. But there's much more traffic at River Street and to have an underpass is very crucial and I would like you to be, make that part of, of that the draft environmental impact report. Uh, yeah, I think uh, from, from DOT's perspective, they're aware of that kind of study or what was looking forward. Uh, kind of the direction I got from DOT is uh, this project really kind of has to focus on the scope that they have, you know, in front of it. Um, and we're not looking to add kind of an underpass at that, you know, it's, it's kind of escalating with where do you kind of stop this project. Uh, so right now, uh, DOT's, you know, unfortunately for you, not looking into creating this underpass at that location. Um, well, not, not saying it's not precluded, but you know, at this yeah. point we're not, we're not looking at it. Draft the, IR. the former Secretary of Transportation endorsed that idea in a meeting that Renata and I were at all three bridges to have underpasses, but yep. with priority for Anderson, which is proceeding. Now, gentlemen, back there. Uh, there's been no uh, talk about noise from construction. Something was going on on the turnpike two or three nights ago that went past midnight. I wonder if the contract for this work is going to limit the time during which construction noise occurs, or is it going to be all night, every night? That's just a sort of rhetorical question, because I, it, the contract isn't let yet. Um, I don't believe that, you're, that the solution to traffic to the River Street Bridge is going to work, because you're shoveling not only Cambridge traffic, but Alston traffic into an intersection that has a turnpike from the west coming in at the same intersection. And frankly, I very seldom cross the River Street Bridge from Stover Drive. But my concern is that when people discover that it takes a long time to get on that route to the River Street Bridge, they're going to start going over the Mass Avenue Bridge and going over to Memorial Drive. Um, mm. You know, people find the fastest route they can get home, and, and uh, I'm sure that it's going to cause more traffic in Cambridge already. And finally, I have a suggestion which I'm sure the rules don't allow, and that would be to have one lane of traffic exiting there, turning only right, using the other lane as a bike lane, and in emergencies, emergency vehicles could use that lane. You could have you know, you could make a lot of space for bikes, and uh, they could share it with one line of one line of traffic. But a fire truck or an ambulance could use the bike lane when necessary. That would take care of. Thank you. I'm going to just you now have comments, and you don't need to feel you need to respond. If you wish to on any of them, just let me know. The the lady in the back. Um, my question is the potential size of the open space it sounds like at the narrowest it may be eight feet wide but at the widest what might it be uh you know it could be i think it was over 100 you know pretty you know, 80 100 feet or so i think it you know vault up pretty pretty wide other comments yes so my name is Brad Bellows. I've lived in Riverside for over 30 years, and I apologize for being late to this discussion. I've been tied up with another big civic engagement process. But I, my concern as a Cambridge resident is the Charles River. The Charles River is our great asset. It's the result of a phenomenal vision by prior generations, which is one of the iconic public spaces in the world. Certainly it's the great treasure and gem of Boston with the emerald necklace and one of its key attributes like the emerald necklace is the continuity of the green space leading from the urban core out to the countryside. And it, it varies in quality along both sides of the river. It expands, it contracts. But the one place where it totally collapses is in the throat. The minute you pass the BU Bridge and before you, by the time you get, and, until you get to River Street Bridge, there's nothing. It's transportation wasteland. And this is a glaring flaw in the system that it is, be, it is incumbent upon us to fix. 
And we have the notion that in 2017, and I say this with all due respect to the consultants who have been given this very narrow transportation mandate with a tough budget, with, by an agency which is under great duress, we, we, I cannot believe in 2017 that we are actually drawing the things that we've seen on this screen, slides 11 and 12, 200 feet of continuous pavement and eight feet of bicycle path along the world's great river, one of, our, one of the world's great rivers. I mean, I actually think these are totally implausible, unacceptable options, with all due respect to everyone who's tried to improve them by nibbling at the edges and making little mitigations. I think this is extremely valuable property, for one thing, 1,500 feet long, 200 feet wide. I wonder why we're not looking at an air rights solution that puts a building on part of it, puts everything underground, Mm -hmm. One level below, no deeper than our subway lines are all over the city, so it's not a water issue. And it's not something other generations thought too costly. And if we could generate some revenue, certainly the air rights isn't going to pay the whole bill. But I honestly think to present these surface only and viaduct only schemes in 2017 when other cities all around the world are trying to recapture, you know, it's like we're going back to Providence, Hartford, New Haven, and, and the Central Artery again. And, and I just don't, I can't quite believe it. I, I really think a major rethink in, in the throat area has got to happen, or this, this thing's going to end up in court. Thank you, Brad. I did, I did prepare some sketches, and I should also say John Shields wasn't able to be here tonight from Cambridge Charles River Alliance, and he asked me to bring the boards that are outside. He's got some wonderful related suggestions, so you might have a look at those. But thank you. And my comment is that on is I saw this outside. I picked it up while you're talking. It's actually a very good idea. So I'm going to give it to you, if Brad hasn't already. But I hope you would consider this for the, for the throat. It would be great for the, it would take out the noise question and give us back the river. I ride my bike along both sides of the river, and I will not cross River Street on the Boston side. I go over to Memorial Drive, cross there. I will not cross there anymore. It's much too dangerous. So this would solve that. I'm glad you're working. You Thank know, you. I need to... I'm just curious, yes. is what you're talking about similar to what they're trying to do in Seattle and they've had all these problems or what? I mean, to me no, that, that seems like a major construction thing to go underneath the chart and to create tunnels under... We're 20 feet, 20 feet below grade. Yeah, but, but what happens to the banks of the river? What ha I mean, this I don't is all know. It's it's it has nothing to do with the river. There's your sketch uh, right there. Take I know, but you don't, you're boring a tunnel. No, no, no it's no. not boring. You can do it. Oh, really? Dig it out. Okay, yeah. all right. And then put the dirt back on. I mean, it was a lovely sketch. But it is the concept similar to what is Seattle. Great. Right? I just have no idea if you can execute it. Okay. Oh, yeah. You reclaim the land above. The last comment, and then we need to vacate the building. You, right there. Okay, um, I just want to say I think this is a brilliant idea, and please, please look at it. And Harvard, Harvard, MIT, BU, I'm sure that they would love to have this in their backyard. It would make all of the, all of our property and all of their property much more valuable. Also, someone said something about maybe no West Station. I believe you said maybe the West Station won't be built. Public transportation has to be main priority because God forbid everybody's driving cars in 2040. Please, let's get some trains and buses or whatever pods, you know, driverless pods, whatever. Just a West Station so the people out in, you know, Newton don't have to drive in. I drive to Newton every day or every week. I love to take a train. Please and don't mix that. Bill and Henrietta to make any concluding comments. And then Kathy will. Oh, I just want to thank you for all your thoughtful comments and contributions to this meeting. Um, I just want to assure you that we will follow up with what you've, uh, what you've discussed and what you've brought forward. There are clearly many things that are unsettled here on the Cambridge side of the river. Uh, and uh, I, I do believe that in the long run, if we were able to present to a DOT what our concerns are, and if we could join forces with Alston to some extent, that, uh, that we could be effective. So thank you all for coming, Bill. Bill? Yeah, um, thanks, and please, if you haven't signed in, um, please sign up so you can get on the Cambridge mailing list. Mascot has their mailing list. We want to develop our own mailing list, so please um, sign in. Thank you.
Kathy. Thanks again. Yeah, and please take your cups and cookies or anything you brought into the room. Thank you so much for coming, and we've got to do a quick exodus. Thank you to CCTV and to Rob for covering this event. And thank you, Mass DOT. Your CCTV? You're doing oh, great. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for moderating.